아, 매일매일 운동하고 있는 성탄호입니다 아, 영화학원을 갔다 왔습니다. 너무 피곤하네요. 아, 지금 10시가 넘었는데, 원래 11시에 자는 게 목표인데. 아. 하겠습니다. 어, 화면이 작아진 것 같지? 많은 학교 학생들은 may be used to logging into school, but now online learning has become the norm for students of every age. So we have four classes a day with 15 minutes in between each class and a 30 minute lunch break. Sam Montag is 13. I think going online is a smart idea because we don't know when we'll be able to get back to school. You know, 24 or two? No, no, two days, two days. Online education has been around for a long time, but it's never been tested quite like this. You know, there's that rule or that guideline that your attention span is only as long as your age in minutes. So for middle schoolers, we're talking attention span is usually 11 to 14 oh, minutes. Oh, no. Dr. Lizette Acosta Corniel has been teaching online classes for a decade. She also teaches in the classroom. She says preparing good online coursework takes time, something coronavirus didn't allow. The education is going to suffer in the sense that the content might not be the same. The experience might be overwhelming for instructors, for parents, for students. Sam is learning a new way to be a student. His advice for his virtual classmates? Just kind of remind yourself that you're still in class and that it is still school even though it's from your house. I'm David Colbert in Wuhan, China. In Yokohama, Japan. CNN in Abu Dhabi. I'm Nevin Vahid in Sinjar, Iran. Northern Syria, Lagos, Nigeria. Stockholm. Outside London. CNN, Sao Paulo, Brazil. In Mexico City. This is CNN. I'm Nick Watt in Los Angeles, and this is CNN. Our breaking news tonight, the Seattle City Council has voted unanimously to ban the use of chokeholds by the police department. Also banned from using, uh, in crowd situations, weapons like chemical irritants, tear gas, water cannons. The move comes as President Trump again says he's considering federal action to address oh. the ongoing occupation of the Capitol Hill Autonomous oh. Zone, now also known as the Capitol Hill well. Organized Protest, or CHOP. Here's Trump today. They don't do the job, I'll do the job. And I've already spoken to the Attorney General about it. But if they don't do the job, we will do the job. Now. Look, you can hear all the legal experts in the world say that's an empty threat. He can't do it. It has to be asked for except for very specific conditions. Let's talk to the Seattle Police Chief, Carmen Best. I'm uh, here to weigh in. Thank you very much for joining us, Chief. Appreciate it. Good evening. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. So I've heard you speak on this several times. Um, forget about the president. Let's just talk about the perception. Uh, you guys are not in control of your own city. You got people all over the place. They burned the police out of the precinct. You didn't like it. You didn't want to surrender the precinct. Uh, the city caved to pressure. Now they're saying you'll never get it back. It'll never be a police station again. Uh, how is that law and order? Well, that's a lot of questions there. But I'll, let me start by saying that. Cherry pick it. Yeah, I will. I'll do that. Um, I can tell you that um, what's happening in Seattle, there's not a no Seattle Police Department response zone, as people have sometimes categorized the, um, the Capitol Hill occupied uh, protest area. You know, there is a small area in a section of the city where we're dealing with some occupants and some of the issues there. But Seattle is not under siege, and we are still responding to every single call in every area of the city. When it comes to that particular area, uh, we have, if they, we get a call, there's an important emergency 911 call, we're going in. We're going to do our job. I have a list of reports we've taken already, but we also have to be considerate of the delicate uh, situation that we have there. The last thing, the last thing I want to do is have any issue of uh, violence um, occur in the area. So we're being very uh, judicial about how we do it, and um, judicious, I mean, right. about how we do it and how we go in. And I would say to you, um, while we're dealing with that issue, 
Um, more than anything, I'm focused on the future. How are we going to re-envision the future of policing with all that we have going on uh, in the country and specifically in Seattle uh, for me today? Uh, well, it's, it, Chief, let, let me just take one more beat on this, and then I want to talk to you about what needs to change. It is hard for people to look at this. Uh, and look, I've spoken to the mayor, oh. and Mayor Durkin has said, you know, this could be a summer of love. This isn't the first time we've seen this. We're not going oh. by it as the rest of you guys are when you see it. It looks bad that they kicked you out of your own police station, and you do not have control of the streets where they are, Chief, just to be fair from all the reporting on the ground. These guys are negotiating with you, uh, calling themselves a sovereign, making lists of demands, and also asking to be taken care of, even though they're a sovereign, which I don't quite understand. Um, how is that to be perceived by people outside of Seattle as a good situation? Well, I wouldn't call it a good situation. I mean, words matter here. So what we have here is a situation where people have occupied an area, and we're working with them. The city is working with them and has negotiators to work with them to have a peaceful resolution. Uh, ultimately, we want to make sure that people don't get hurt. Uh, and it's not a situation where there's lawlessness. I mean, we do have some concerns, but we are responding to the area. We're doing so carefully. We're making sure that we take care of reports that have been given uh, and that we're following up on each of those reports and trying to make sure that people are arrested and we find any perpetrators of any crime. So that has not stopped. But you, admittedly, there are some barricades uh, that, pre that prevent us from going in as quickly and as efficiently as we'd like to. And certainly because we're not in the precinct, uh, response times across the entire East Precinct, air East Precinct area have increased. So I definitely want our officers back in that precinct. Uh, I'm not thrilled about the situation, but we recognize, too, that we have to make sure that we protect everyone's safety, ultimately, uh, in the situation. What is the one thing, people always ask for like dozens of points of change, let's just start with one uh, to get past the status quo that we're in. What is one thing you think has to change? Well, there's a lot of things, but I would say we'll start with, we have to just re-envision how we're going to move forward. You know, the Seattle Police Department has been under a consent decree for almost a decade now, and we had done everything that we were asked to do by the federal government. And yet, when I stood at the parade the other day, the Black Lives Matter march, I should say not parade, um, it was very clear to me that it wasn't successful. People are angry. Uh, they had a lot of signs about uh, the police department and defunding the police department and issues of brutality. And we can't ignore that. We have to acknowledge that there's a long history there. Uh, and having the you know a federal consent decree did not resolve the issues that we're dealing with. And I, I really sat and thought about it, and I really had an epiphany about we're going to have to change. And having one institution, such as the courts, that itself has its own history of racist practices and oppression, trying to direct another institution, which is the police department, which is struggling through our own history, isn't the answer. We have got to work directly with the community. we got to invite them in, bring them in under the tent, engage with them so that we know that we're doing the right thing and the community as well. We work for the people and we, we let them down in some ways. Very clearly by the number of demonstrations that we're seeing and the number of black men who are dying at the hands of injustice. Well, it can't happen soon enough. Chief, we will continue to watch the situation. I appreciate you coming on the show. You are always invited to make the case uh, to this audience. Thank you. Chief Carmen Thank Best, I wish you the best. Take care. Thank you. Uh. All right, now look, this is happening in Seattle in the context of one case, then another case, then another case. Now we have the shooting, the death of Ray Shard Brooks, okay? This is a reminder of two other high-profile police killings of young black men. And yes, police officers have been getting hurt also, shot, killed. Is that an aspect of this problem? Of course. It's all about unnecessary violence. This case, though, Brooks is going to be a tough one. It's going to be controversial for good and bad reason. Let's get perspective for some top legal and policing minds. Next. Uh.
is a very exciting time of our lives as creatives. Africa avant-garde, this weekend on CNN. Coronavirus is affecting the entire country, the world. Are we ready? Oh, I don't want. In the beginning of outbreaks like this, nobody knows what's happening. We're determined to keep reporting the story. Yes, I knew it, because that seems well, to be what worries you. No, because we're ready for it. These are the moments where our humanity really does shine through. That's the hardest part. It's hard, actually. Not just on Jacob, to CNN. over and over again for years 50 years ago my father was demonstrating with sanitation workers over 50 years and they have signs saying i'm, I'm not black lives today have signs 52 years later saying black lives matter and not just blacks blacks whites young oh, people, older people latino and hispanics others have joined because they see this injustice that exists in this country and people are not just crying out, people are saying change must occur now. I only hope our elected officials' ears are open and eyes are open and that movement takes place right away. The time is now. There's nothing more powerful in all the world than an idea whose time has come. Santos de Cartier. Now the story goes that in early 20th century Paris, Louis Cartier of the famous jewelry clan had a Brazilian friend, Alberto Santos Dumont. Santos Dumont was one of the pioneers of aviation, but Louis Cartier often heard him complain about the fact that checking your time when you were flying one of the planes of those days for which you needed both hands was very difficult when all you have is pocket watch. So after a while, Louis Cartier presents Santos Dumont with a, one of the first ever purpose-built wristwatches. And that watch has come down to us as the Santos de Cartier.